Greetings, saints of the Most High. Welcome back to the Messianic Tour Observer. I'm Rod Thomas coming to you on a picture-perfect spring preparation day in the DFW. And I pray that you, your families, and fellowships are abundantly well and blessed. As I am recording and posting this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer, it is Friday, April 5th, 2024 on the Roman calendar. And we are just a few days away from the biblical Rosh Hashanah, our true Hebrew New Year, Aviv 1. This Shabbat, then, is referred to as Shabbat HaChodesh, or the Sabbath of the first month, which is based on Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. Now, you should know up front that Shabbat HaChodesh, or the Sabbath of the first month, is not, I'll repeat, it is not one of the Moedim, the set-apart feast of Jehovah. Instead, it is simply a Sabbath that is marked by our Jewish brethren as sort of an alert, or sort of a heads-up, if you will, and it is meant to prepare us to receive Biblical Rosh Hashanah, or Aviv 1, our Biblical New Year. Now, I published a blog post a month ago entitled Shabbat HaChodesh and Guarding the Month of the Aviv Thoughts and Reflections, where I go into some detail on the significance of this Shabbat and how it prepares us in mind, heart, and body to receive the Biblical Rosh Hashanah. And if you're interested, I have provided the link to that post for your convenience. I also posted a discussion explaining the current calendar confusion among observationalists in our faith community as it relates to exactly where and when Rosh Hashanah 2024 is supposed to hit. So check those out. The links are there for your convenience, and I hope that it will be of benefit to you. Now, since we're talking about the calendar, let me give you a little bit of update, since we are at a critical time on Father's calendar year. As I mentioned just a moment ago, we are just a few days out from Biblical Rosh Hashanah, Aviv 1. And searchers in the land of Israel are planning to look for the renewed moon of the first month of Yah's biblical calendar year on this coming Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. So I will ask you if you are interested in following the observational calendar dates for this coming Rosh Hashanah to check back with us on our website, TheMessianicTourObserver.org. Again, TheMessianicTourObserver.org for their findings. Now, they're going out on the 9th of April, which places us on the observational calendar on the 29th day of this 13th biblical month. Now, if they are successful in sighting the renewed moon, it will be Biblical Rosh Hashanah. It will be the first month of Yah's brand new biblical calendar year. And it all is hinging on, at this point, the sighting of the renewed moon. Because by this time, in just about three or four days, we already know that the barley is in a state of Aviv. It is in an Aviv state of maturation. So that part is out of the way. Now it's just a matter of sighting the renewed moon over the land of Israel. Now, if they are unsuccessful in sighting the renewed moon on Tuesday, April the 9th, then it will default, the biblical new year will default to that of April the 11th. So let me rehash that because I'm sure we do everything beginning, a day begins at sunset, sunset, 
okay? Just so we know, so we're all on the same page because you're probably uh, confusing some of you. We look at every day as beginning and ending at sunset. It's not like the Roman calendar, which a day begins at midnight. Under the Hebrew reckoning of time, a day begins at sunset. So if the searchers are going out and looking for the renewed moon on the 9th of April, Tuesday, the 9th of April, and they sight it, then at sundown on the 9th of April, we are at Rosh Hashanah, the biblical new year, which translates over into the biblical new year being April 10th. It's the next day. It's in the Roman way of keeping it, okay? But it actually begins at sunset. So in all reality, we're looking at biblical Rosh Hashanah hitting on either Wednesday, April 10th, or if the renewed moon is not sighted on Tuesday evening, then we default to biblical Rosh Hashanah falling out on Thursday, April the 11th. I'm really being careful in parsing out my words because it can get a little confusing, simply because we here in the West follow, well, in our faith, here in the West and in our faith community, we're, we're, we're kind of challenged between two calendar and two reckonings of time. Again, we are the people who are not of faith, who are not in the Hebrew mindset, begin their days each day at midnight. And a new day begins at the following midnight, and so forth and so forth. For us in the Hebrew, a new day begins at sunset. And it ends at sunset, and then the cycle repeats, of course, of course, of course. Now, then, if once we get into Rosh Hashanah, biblical Rosh Hashanah, why is it important? Why is biblical Rosh Hashanah important? Well, I have posted numerous teachings on why Aviv 1, the first day of the first biblical calendar month of the year, is so important because Father said so. He said, you are to guard the month of the Aviv. You are to keep the, 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 the month of the Aviv. And again, I've done multiple, multiple teachings on it. And um, I may repost those to kind of help those of you who are new to faith to understand the importance. Biblical Rosh Hashanah is not a Moedim. It is not a feast day per se, but it is a special day. And it is, in a sense, a holy day because it is a day and a month that Father has instructed us to keep as special and holy. And why is it important? Because we have to get that day right. We have to know when that day hits in order to know when the rest of the feast days of 2024 will hit because Father has instructed us to keep his set-apart days on the days that he has appointed them to be. There is no quibbling. There is no compromising. There is no debating on when we are going to keep the seven mandated feast of Yah. They are to be kept on the exact dates that Father has given us. And so in order to know what those days and dates are, we have to know exactly when Aviv 1 hits. So that's why we are to guard it. Because if that's out of sync, if we're off on that, then we're going to be off on our keeping of Yah's set-apart days. That's why we are kind of separated. That's why we have this little... I don't know what to call it, wall in a way, between those of us who are the observationalists in the faith, 
community and those who are of the calculated calendar. And this year, <clears throat> their biblical Rosh Hashanah is going to be about a day off from us. If the renewed moon is sighted on Tuesday the 9th, we will be exactly a day after them. Their Rosh Hashanah is going to be on actually Tuesday, April 9th, based upon the calculated calendar. Our, one, our Rosh Hashanah, we're believing, depending again if it's cited, will be on the following day, the 10th, Wednesday, the 10th of April. So we're always about a day separated from, in general, from the Jewish calculated calendar. So moving on, the next day, biblical Rosh Hashanah. So the next day of importance in the month of the Aviv, now we're entering into the spring feast of Yah. And the next important feast day is Pesach, AKA Passover. And depending upon when the renewed moon is sighted next week, we will, Pesach, Passover will hit either on Tuesday, April 23rd, or Wednesday, April 24th. The next day is, begins the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that will be either, depending on the renewed moon sighting, Wednesday, April the 24th, or Thursday, April the 30th. And it runs for seven days. Within this seven-day period, we have what is called the wave sheaf or first fruits, day of first fruits. And that is another day that I, it would require me to do a full teaching upon it because it is so, it's such an important, I may, I don't know, I'll have to go back and look at my list of teachings on the spring feast and see if this is, uh, if I have sufficient enough content out there to help those of you who may be new to the faith understand the importance of these three important days, Pesach, the seven-day festival of unleavened bread, and the wave sheaf or day of first fruits. These are important to understand. They are shadow pictures of good things to come. They are about our masters, the person, the ministry, earthly ministry of our Master Yeshua Messiah. There he is broadly depicted in these feasts, and it is important that we gain an understanding of them so that we may better understand our salvation, our redemption, and the coming kingdom of Yah through the person and ministry of Yeshua Messiah. Now, that wave sheaf offering just so I make sure I get that out, will be either, it, well, it won't be either. It doesn't matter if we are a day or two off because of the sighting of the renewed moon. It is indefinitely, it is definitely going to be on Sunday, April 28th. But I'll get more into that as we get closer to the day. Now, let's get into our reading for this Shabbat. This week's Torah reading is contained in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 through chapter 3, verse 22. And for all intents and purposes, it is a continuation of last week's reading. It is the 127th parasha of our three-year Torah reading cycle. And I've been led to title this week's Sabbath reading discussion in the form of a question. And the question is, why do we dislike the God of the Old Testament? <laughs> no doubt a curious title to some. I feel this is a viable question, especially as it relates to the warrior side of Jehovah that is captured in our Torah, our Haftarah, and apostolic readings for this Shabbat. 
So what do I mean by God of the Old Testament? Well, some may be confused by the title God of the Old Testament. And let me assure you, it is not a biblical title by which or by any stretch of the imagination. It is not a biblical title. But it is a title that many within and without our faith community have assigned to Jehovah our Elohim, well, for various and sundry reasons. The primary reason people have assigned Jehovah this title, God of the Old Testament, is to make a distinction between Abba Yah and the Son, Yeshua Messiah. Now, many distinguish the so-called God of the Old Testament from the so-called God of the New Testament because Jehovah is erroneously portrayed by spiritually, what I would describe as spiritually myopic and misinformed teachers of Scripture, as a tyrannical, a violent, an angry, an unforgiving, a callous, a harsh, an uncompromising, warmongering, and murderous God. While his counterpart, Yeshua, God of the New Testament, is portrayed by equally misinformed teachers of Scripture as a loving, a forgiving, life-giving, healing, long-suffering, giving, caring, and liberal God. Consequently, many so-called people of faith, and most if not all non-believing folks, dislike, if not hate, the God of the Old Testament, but like, if not love, the God of the New Testament for their respectively assigned character traits. Embarrassingly, the distinction between the two is severely muddied when some of these same folks conflate the two entities, Jehovah and the Son, Yeshua. Many God of the Old Testament haters, some of whom are self-professing Christians, believe it or not, firmly believe that their much-preferred God of the New Testament is also the God of the Old Testament. And that befuddles me, because there are several problems with this thinking which we won't get into in this installment of TMTO. But if you followed me and this program for any length of time, you would know that I do not believe that Scripture supports Yeshua and Jehovah being one and the same person. And again, I'm not interested in getting into that in this particular posting. Because the Scripture clearly distinguishes, and I'm just going to say this on this issue, of the divinity, the conflation of Jehovah and Yeshua as one person, the same person. I'll leave it at this. The scripture clearly distinguishes them as two distinct persons. Now, I've gone ahead. Let's see. I did a... I did do a posting on the divinity of Yeshua back in 2016. And if you're interested in hearing why I take this position, if it interests you, I would encourage you to go on over to the MessianicTourObserver.org, type in the search bar, the divinity of Yeshua, and it should bring up, I think it was a two-part series thing I did, or mini-series I did, and it will hopefully explain to you why I believe that Yeshua is not Jehovah. And again, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole or the rabbi hole of defining who Abba Yah and who Yeshua Messiah are as it will take us off topic for today. And I don't want to do that. 
I want to respect your time. I've already gone long as enough as it is. But suffice to say that both the Son and the Father possess and exercise warrior traits, believe it or not. And we will discuss the problems and misunderstandings that are associated with judging Jehovah's warrior persona and intentions later on in this discussion. It's an interesting, interesting issue that needs to be discussed. So what do you say we get into Yah's word? Go in and possess the land. Take two. Go in and possess the land, take two. So in this reading, we find that the punishment has ended. 38 years has passed. And now it's time for us to go in and take possession of the land. The punishment has ended. The sins of our first generation Exodus parents died with them over our 38 year wandering period. Therefore, Yah says to Moshe, Rav Lechem, Rav Lechem, too much for you, head north. Long enough you have been skirting this mountain, so turn yourselves north. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. So we would now go north after going around the mountain for many years and we would return to Kadesh Barnea bypassing our cousins, the Edomites. The Edomites are the sons of Esau. Ammonites and Moabites who are the descendants of Lot. Their lands and possessions were not under the ban. They were not under, we're not targeting those lands. They're not under the same conquest ban that the Canaanites were under. Because these lands were allotted to the descendants of Esau. And Esau was a son of Isaac, of Yishak, and descendants of Lot. And we were not to interfere with their Yah-given heritage. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 5, verse 9, and verse 19. However, Yah gave into our hands the lands as we headed north towards Canaan, into the Transjordan, Yah gave into our hands the lands held by King Sion and the Amorites, chapter 2, verse 31, and chapter 3, verse 6 of our reading in Deuteronomy. And he gave into our hands the land held by Og of Bashan, the giant. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 of our reading. And these battles were the first test of our strength our fighting skills, and most important, our faith and obedience to Jehovah's commands to go and take the land. Our parents failed to obey and trust Yah, and thus the death sentence was imposed upon our first generation parents. And we wandered in the desert, in the wilderness for 38 years. Well, those days were now done. The sins of the parents have now been completed. The punishment for those sins have been completed, and we're now ready to enter the land. And these battles that we fought against Sion and Og gave us street creds, so to speak, among the neighboring people's nations, especially over the Jordan, over the west side of the Jordan, the people of Canaan, became terrified because we took out the Ammonites and Og's people of Bashan. And these neighboring people nations grew to fear us greatly as the fear of Yah and his people permeated the entire region. Because Jehovah, 
is our mighty warrior. His will shall always be done. And thus we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. So we of this second generation, this second Exodus generation, have experienced a miraculous turnaround in terms of our faith and our obedience. And one would think that we would have continued in the way of our parents, being that of a rebellious, faithless, and disobedient people. But we didn't. And how this happened, or how this came to be, the record is silent. But Yah works in mysterious ways, and His mercies are endless, and they're renewed every day. Now, we as a nation had a shining future ahead of us, and we were poised to meet our destiny in the taking of the land of promise. So no longer would the stain and the stench of our parents' stubbornness, our parents' faithlessness, our parents' disobedience cause our nation to remain as wanderers under a, under a perpetual death sentence. This is indeed a prophetic shadow picture of unredeemed humanity wandering about the stark wilderness of this world and this life under a death sentence, no hope for reprieve, save for Yah's grace and mercies through the person and ministries of Yeshua Messiah. So Hasatan's plot, getting back to us and our First and second generation Exodus folks, Hasatan, Satan's plot to steal, kill, and destroy our nation, the nation Yisrael, had been foiled. Of this situation, Jeffrey Enoch Feinberg and Kim Alan Moody of the Walk Deuteronomy Words Commentary stated the following, which I found very wonderful, which I found very inspiring and clarifying. They wrote, thus, acts of the fathers must be redeemed by the sons. Otherwise, the consequences for future generations grow, even as the sons hardened by mindlessly embracing the sins of their fathers. History hardens when sin festers. End quote. Praise be to Yah. So he prepared us, us being the second generation Exodus Yisraelites. He prepared us for this redo of the first botch fulfillment of our redemption. I refer you to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. And the Legacy Standard Bible rendering reads as follows. For Yahweh, your God, has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. These 40 years, Yahweh, your God, has been with you. You have not lacked a thing. Let's break this down. One, Yah blessed us. He blessed this second generation Exodus nation. Two, Yah was well aware of our situation. In other words, Yah never abandoned us or turned away and left us alone. He was always on top of our progress in becoming the nation that he was looking for in order to go in, take possession of the land. Three, 
despite our past failures, Yah remained with us. He did not abandon us. Talk about faithfulness. Yah was faithful in his keeping power, in his leading, in his fulfilling of the covenant promise. And four, Yah provided for all our needs. We were fed, we were watered, and we grew into a mighty great nation. So we were set for redo of the first botch redemption. So Yah would perform in us, through us, a redo of our redemption from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. This redo would be replete, would include with our journey from the mountain of Elohim to Kadesh Barnea, the gateway of the promised land, even down to a vicious, hateful king whose heart Yah would harden. And I would refer you to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 30, Exodus chapter 9, verse 12, Exodus chapter 10, verse 20, and verse 27, Exodus 11, verse 10, and Exodus 14, verse 4. So we're doing a redo, almost similar to our exodus out of Egypt, out of Mitzrayim. We would overcome, through Yah's miraculous power in leading, what one might naturally presume to be nations that were superior to us in strength and fighting ability. And Yah's name would once again become known by the inhabitants of Canaan as the God of Yisrael and as the one true God. This was our redemption redo. Exodus chapter 9, verses 16. And this is the KJV rendering. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee, Israel, up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Our redemption as a powerful and great people began to take shape when we, through Yah's divine help, took possession of the lands once belonging to Sion, chapter 2, verse 24 of our reading. Now, originally, Jehovah instructed us to petition, to ask Sion for permission to pass through his lands peacefully as we transition toward the land of promise. But in response to Sion's aggression and hardened heart, Jehovah gave us the victory over Sion as we devoted the people of his kingdom to destruction. These were put under the ban the same band that many of the nations inhabiting Canaan, the land of promise, were put under. Chapter 2, verses 30 through 35 of our reading. In every advance we made towards achieving our destiny, we were careful to go and take possession of land that Jehovah instructed us to. This shows that we were under Yah's leadership. We were not under the leadership of some ambitious, greedy oligarch who destroyed, who killed, and maimed haphazardly. Thus, when we are operating under Jehovah's strict leading, and this applies to every aspect of our lives today, when we operate under Yah's strict leading, His authority, and His direction, we act under His perfect will and purpose and plan. And when we do that, that's a good thing because it's going to happen in accordance with Yah's will. We will be okay. We will overcome any impediments because we are operating in our purpose and accordance with the will 
and plan of Jehovah. Too many of us operate outside the leading and will of Yah. And that usually turns out really bad for us. So it's important that we take this example outlined here in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 30 through 37, and see how operating within Yah's will is super important if we are going to succeed in our day-to-day -day walk with Messiah. So, moving forward, we repeated our conquest of the lands east of the Jordan when Og of Bashan, a giant believed to be of the race of the Raphaim, came out to challenge us in battle. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Unlike Sion, who decided to be a jerk and not allow us to pass through his land, he says, well, I'm, not, I'm only not going to allow you to pass through land. I'm going to go out and challenge you. And then we kicked his behind and took his land. Og, on the other hand, decided, you know what? I'm going to hedge my bets and I'm going out to meet them in battle now. And so he goes out and he meets us in battle. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But like scions of Heshbon, we devoted Og and his people to destruction. Chapter 3, verse 6. Now, I have spoken a great deal about Yah marking certain peoples for destruction on this program. This was, to borrow a term used frequently in Islam, a Jehovah-directed jihad, or a holy war, in its truest and purest sense. And I've gone ahead and I've posted the, um, one of the teachings I did regarding marking, Yah marking certain people for destruction, putting them under the ban. And when we talk about the marking of certain peoples for destruction or them being put under the ban, we're talking complete and utter destruction of that nation. There were certain nations that Yah said, just go in, defeat them. You can take prisoners and slaves. You can take their property and what they, or you can take their stuff called booty, war booty and things of that nature. That's all well and good. But there were certain groups of people. And generally, these were certain groups of people whose sin was so great or there was something about those people that Yah could not allow to continue to live and exist. And those nations, those people, their property, everything was to be destroyed, utterly destroyed. And there were strict, there were tremendous restrictions regarding what could be taken as war booty and what prisoners could be taken, if any. Generally, you couldn't do anything with, these, with the people or with their property and so forth because depending upon who they were and the severity of their sin or their corruption, would, would, depending upon that, would determine whether the, the extent of the ban or the extent of the destruction. But returning back, so I've gone ahead and I'll put in the transcript of this discussion the link to that teaching, which is entitled Obedience to Torah Marked for Destruction. Um, and I'll go ahead and put that link in the transcript for your convenience. Now, after our defeat, after their defeat, Sion and Og's kingdoms, I should say, their kingdoms were distributed among the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. And we talked about this in detail. Yeah, so we... Um, we discuss this in detail in our study of reading 122, 
just five, uh, five readings, five Shabbats ago. Um, that, that teaching was entitled, The High Expectations for God's People to Fulfill His Will and Purpose. Thoughts and Reflections on Tour, Reading 122. I've gone ahead and put the link to that discussion in the shows in this post transcript for your convenience as well, if in case you missed it. But so from here, Moshe takes us to where we were that day, this day that he's delivering, Deuteronomy. He's speaking to the second generation, Exodus, Israelites, Deuteronomy. The entire book of Deuteronomy is where we are. There at the gateway to the promised land, preparing to go in and take possession of the land. And it's agreed, going back to the Torah reading discussion 122, it's agreed that Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh would fight alongside the rest of our nation until the land was ours, fully ours, and then they would return to their homes here in the Transjordan. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 21 and 22 reads, and this is the Legacy Standard Bible, and I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh your God has done to these two kings. So Yahweh shall do all the kingdoms into which you are about to cross. Do not fear them, for Yahweh your God is the one fighting for you. Bear in mind that phrase. For Yahweh, Jehovah, your God, is the one fighting for you. This phrase in verse 22 of Deuteronomy chapter 3 is the crux of the rest of our discussion for today. But before we get too deep into this, Yahweh, your God, is the one fighting for you, discussing the warrior trait of our Creator, Yehovah. Let's take a quick look at our Haftarah reading, which is contained in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 8 through 19. I'm not going to read it. It's too voluminous for us to read in our condensed time remaining. But the key phrase of our Haftarah reading is, Yet I will exult in Jehovah. Yet I will exult in Jehovah. Despite the horrifying turmoil going on around me, was what the prophet wrote. The prophet clearly and fully trusted in his God to do what? to fight on his and the remnant Israel's behalf. And so here, in our Haftarah reading, in the Sefer or the Sefer of Habakkuk, stands as the mighty warrior, if not Yisrael's mighty warrior. Now the sages, the Jewish, the so-called Jewish sages and scholars are challenged by Habakkuk chapter 3. Yehovah stands as the mighty warrior, if not Yisrael's mighty warrior. Now, many so-called Jewish sages believe Habakkuk 3 was a poetic, a mystical retelling of Shavuot, a.k.a. Pentecost at Mount Sinai. That it's a poetically grand illustration of the revelation at Sinai because it extols the unimaginable power of Jehovah concerning his people in all creation. And it includes Yah's recompense of those that tribulate his chosen ones. Indeed, Yah is Yisrael's mighty warrior. Thus, the prophet ends his words with a commitment that transcends anything that may befall him. This is Habakkuk, ends his prophecy with the following. Chapter 3 of Habakkuk, verses 17 through 19. 
And the Lexham English Bible reads, Though the fig tree does not blossom, nor there be fruit on the vines, the yield of the olive tree fails, and the cultivated fields do not yield food. The flock is cut off from the animal pen, and there is no cattle in the stalls. And verse 18, and this is the crux of the matter. Yet I will rejoice in Jehovah. I will exult in the God of my salvation. Verse 19, Jehovah, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. He causes me to walk on my high places. Into our apostolic reading, which is contained in the Sefer, or Sefer of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. Again, we won't read it because of oppressive time. The featured figure in this passage of Revelation is that of a rider on a white horse. And there is no mystery as to who this rider is. It is, of course, Yeshua Messiah, returning to earth as the conquering king and Lord of Lords. And his appearance pairs well with the imagery put forth by the prophet Habakkuk in our Haftarah reading. Because the one who rides the white horse destroys the enemies of Jehovah and of Jehovah's people. Again, Jehovah is depicted here as the mighty one, the mighty warrior of Yisrael. But this time, Yah's warrior actions are enacted by his right hand. His Mashiach, Yisrael's king, Yehoshua HaMashiach. So with all of this, let's talk about Yehovah's warrior side. The warrior side of Yehovah has and remains a point of contention among many within and without our faith community. Many individuals choose to use this attribute to advance their anti-God, their anti-Bible, their anti-Israel agenda. And these contend that Jehovah is a hateful, a vengeful, a callous, a murderous entity who cares little to nothing about his human creation. Such individuals delude themselves into thinking and promoting the foolish and patently false claim that the Almighty would just as soon destroy all who cross him and oppose his plans and purposes than to show compassion, love, mercy, and grace to a race of beings that desperately need such things. I've heard some, yea, even some so-called Christians, go so far as to reject Jehovah on the basis of his warrior persona. They often label him as the God of the Old Testament, no doubt meant to be a cheap jab at him. These individuals are not ashamed to proclaim that they prefer the God of the New Testament, Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ, to the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah. And of course, the God of the New Testament these are referring to as Jesus Christ. Now, I've recently heard of an elder that I personally know. Um, he's an elder of one of the Worldwide Church of God splinters. And I understand, I've not personally heard him say such things, but I have heard through a third party that he recently, in open discussion, and in a discussion, castigates the person of Jehovah. Now, this self-styled social justice warrior, and that's what I would label him as, because that's really what he is, questioned Jehovah's motives in leading us. When I say us, I'm talking about this second generation, Exodus, Israelite nation, 
leading us in war against the occupiers of Canaan and the Transjordan, in effect, marking them, these nations, for destruction. Recall what I just mentioned about the destruction was utter of these nations. It was complete. No mercy. Well, this same soul even questions and challenges Jehovah's motives in permitting various injustices go unaddressed in the world today. He sees Jehovah as the same, following the same format in causing mayhem and chaos and heart uh, bloodshed and all the terrible things of this world even today. So he has a problem with Jehovah. And it's troubling to hear of such sadly misinformed and misguided individuals, many of whom claim to be born-again Christians, believers, followers of Christ. And clearly these individuals who claim to identify with the love and person of the Son of God missed what the Son of God said about his relationship to the creator of the universe. He said in John chapter 10, verse 30, and in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, that if you see me, you've seen the Father, and that I and my Father are one. We're echad. But here's the irony in their thinking. Although Yeshua's persona was one of love, kindness, sacrifice, and so forth during his earthly ministry, which appeals to most as, let's just say, their preferred God today. Indeed, at that time, he was the suffering servant, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. Of What's not to love? Of course we love him for what he was and what he stood for and his example. However, when you look at our apostolic reading this week, it clearly points to Master Yeshua as a, what a conquering warrior king who will right all wrongs and establish his kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, John the Revelator depicts Yeshua as the king who will rule with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter two, verse twenty-seven. Revelation chapter twelve, verse five and Revelation 19, verse 15. The days of the suffering Messiah will have been long past, and this Messiah will tolerate no foolishness. He will be the righteous judge and the conquering warrior. He will be just like his daddy, hallelujah. Indeed, Yeshua, along with the other apostolic writers, contend that Master Yeshua possessed the exact character traits and personal attributes of his father, Yehovah. So to condemn Yehovah for his righteous actions, which often involve cutting short the lives of certain nations and people, as we just discussed, is to operate in ignorance of the true nature of the great I am. It is to operate from a sinful place of self-righteousness and ignorance to the existence of evil and good in this world. And the simple fact that in Yah's perspective, good and evil are incompatible bedfellows. Because at the end of the day, Jehovah requires the eradication of evil and all impediments and challenges to his irresistible sovereignty and plan. You see, Yah operates at a level that is far above our own. He is the creator of all. So who are we to challenge him, to challenge his sovereignty, to challenge his righteous actions that he wrought to advance his plan? to redeem and save humanity from the scourge of sin and death. Of himself, Yah declared through the mouth and pen of his holy prophet, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. And the Legacy Standard Bible reads, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways, declares Yehovah. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So who are we indeed to challenge Jehovah and question his righteous mo motives? The same prophet proffered the following, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. This time the KJV reads, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do, and all we do, as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. When Job experienced his crisis of faith, which prompted his challenging of Jehovah, the father asked him, and this is Job chapter 38, verse 4, father asked Job, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? You see, when we get to the place where we reduce and where we judge Jehovah according to human standards, our human standards of righteousness, which Yah declared was nothing more than filthy rags, it means that we either don't know Jehovah, or we, like Job, are amid a crisis of faith. It's not that Job didn't know Yah. His problem was he was going through a crisis of faith. He just lost everything, and he was enduring tremendous physical problems. But the problem when one goes through a crisis of faith where they start challenging Jehovah and challenging and second-guessing his motives, that if we don't emerge from that crisis of faith, we run the risk of estrangement from our Heavenly Father. Indeed, to possess such hostile thoughts and feelings toward our loving, gracious, holy, and righteous Creator is to instead be rebellious toward Him. And as it relates to our rebelliousness, Jehovah declared, Rebellion is as the sin of divination, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10. And insubordination is as wickedness and idolatry. And this comes from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 19. And it has to do with King Saul. And so the prophet says to King Saul in relation to King Saul's rebelliousness and his insubordination towards Yah, he says, because you, King Saul, have rejected the word of Jehovah, he, Jehovah, has also rejected you from being king. I mentioned previously that to challenge Jehovah's holy and righteous motives is often founded on anti-God and anti-Israel sentiments. Not always, but often. Well, let's consider for a moment what we're seeing played out in this nation related to the ongoing conflict between Israel and the evil terrorist organization Hamas. Despite the horrific event Hamas wrought upon the innocent citizens of Israel on October 7, 2023, which resulted in Israel acting in her defense, aggressively acting, rightfully so, in her defense, many people in this nation, I'm talking here in the West, in particular the U.S., again acting from a place of self-righteousness, are aggressively promoting a violent agenda that calls for the destruction of Israel and the turning over of Haaretz, the land, to the so-called Palestinians. Now, some of these are demanding, these protesters are demanding that Israel cease defending herself and permanently turning over portions of the land to their aggressors, the Palestinians and Hamas and Hezbollah, in what they call a two-state solution to the conflict. 
Those who engage in such foolish rhetoric are writing checks that their behinds can't cash. For the land belongs to Jehovah. He has owned that land from the beginning. Psalm chapter 21 verse 1. And the scriptures ISR read, The earth belongs to Jehovah in all that fills it. Now of Ha-Aretz, the land of Yisrael, Moshe revealed the following. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 10 through 12. And the scriptures, ISR, read, For the land which you were going in to possess is not like the land of Mitzrayim. It's not like the land of Egypt from which you have come where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you are preparing over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of the heavens, a land which Jehovah your Elohim looks after. Yah looks after the land. And the eyes of your Elohim are always on it. Always from the beginning of the year to the latter end of the year. And again, that's Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 10 through 11. Internalize this passage in your heart, especially when you're confronted with negative rhetoric about the right of Israel to defend herself and to lay hold to the possession that they have over the land. So, Yah has every right to grant access and possession of the land to whomever he chooses. And, oh, by the way, Jehovah chose to gift the land, Ha-Aretz, Yisrael, to the descendants of Jacob, of Jacob. So neither the godless world leaders nor the nation-state of Yisrael, yes, even Israel, Neither of these two possess the authority to change the arrangements that Jehovah set in place for the land four or so millennia ago. And this whole question of Israel having rights to the land is secondary to Jehovah's will and plan of salvation, redemption, and restoration. Jehovah's plan and purpose for all humanity is being worked through the Torah concept of a land, a people, and a covenant. A land, a people, and a covenant. And any who would desire to partake of Jehovah's grand plan of salvation, redemption, and restoration, well, they must get on the same page that Jehovah is on. And to do that is to believe to trust Jehovah and enter into and remain in a covenant relationship with him through the person and ministries of Yeshua Messiah. This has nothing to do with our personal feelings, our perceptions of the modern nation of Israel, nor the humanitarian crisis that is happening in Gaza now. It's about trust. It's about faith in Jehovah and the resulting relationship we must have with him in order that we may enter his glorious kingdom that now operates within us, his beloved, and that will in the future come into this world, the world tomorrow. Because at the end of the day, Jehovah is in control, and he is still on the throne, and he owns us. And we are subject to his will and plans. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Ezekiel 18, 4. And the KJV reads, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so we are required to trust and obey him. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. 
And the KJV reads, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And what is the conclusion of the whole matter? It is to fear God. It is to keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, to fear God and keep his commandments. It's not about us trying to be social justice warriors in spouting off at the mouth and taking actions against what God is doing through his people. We need to stop that foolishness. And then the other aspect we talked about earlier, that people despise the God of the Old Testament because he's violent. He's a murderer. He's harsh. He's unyielding. Well, truth be told, our God is truly a God of the living. Despite the enemy's claims to the contrary. Luke chapter 20, verse 38. And our master said, Now he, Jehovah, is not the Elohim of the dead, but the Elohim of the living. For all live to him. In other words, life comes through him. He is the God of the living. And, oh, he's so evil. He doesn't care about humanity. He wants the destruction of God. He wants the, the destruction of all humanity, especially those that don't agree with him. Same foolishness that the Israelites had. That, oh, he's brought us out here to destroy us, to harm us. Rubbish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And the scriptures, ISR read, is not Jehovah, is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness. Slowness, I'm sorry. Jehovah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness but is patient toward us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then over to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. The same scripture ISR reads, For I know the plans. This is Yah speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, For I know the the plans I am planning for you, declares Jehovah, plans of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and an expectancy. Behind the scenes of life, as portrayed in our reading over the last few weeks, and going forward to the end of our three-year reading cycle when the fall feast of 2024 comes around, Jehovah is busy at work deconstructing the kingdom of darkness and bringing in its stead about the glorious Malkut Elohim, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And this means that Jehovah's will must be carried out, even though his, his will may at times infringe upon our misplaced sense of righteousness. Jehovah has, again, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so Jehovah has a reason for doing everything he does. What we think or how we feel about that which he does means absolutely nothing when weighed against his unimaginable plans and his will for those who are his. During our second generation Exodus cousins conquering and taking possession of the land, it turns out that because it was Jehovah's will that his bride take possession of the land, he was the one who defeated the Canaanites for Israel. Israel was simply the righteous tool that Jehovah used to eradicate evil from the land. A reference to Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. So what does any of this say to us today? It simply says that Jehovah has a plan, that he is working out on a global and individual basis. 
Globally, Jehovah will personally right all wrongs and establish his kingdom here on earth as it is currently in heaven. And his beloved son will reign as king over his kingdom. In so doing, righteousness and holiness will be restored to the land and Jehovah's people be made eternally whole. Shalom. Jehovah will restore that which the devourer has taken. Joel chapter 2 verse 25. Paradise lost will become paradise restored. Fallen humanity must be restored to its original created state that Yah deemed as being very good. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. We must be redeemed and made whole as a people, as his new creation. So death must be erased. And Jehovah is going to do what he must do to make all this and so much more happen. And from an individual standpoint, Jehovah simply invites us to get on the winning side. That's it. And that, again, requires our complete and unadulterated trust and obedience. Because we are his workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. And we're destined unto good works. All that we have then belongs to him, even our own souls. Everything we have, we receive through his grace, his mercy, his provision, and his grace. All of which he lavishes upon those of us. Belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. Yah just allows us access to use those blessed resources until he replaces those things with things that will be far better and greater for us in the world tomorrow. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12. We serve a great God. He's not a terrible, horrible God as so many people have painted him, the God of the Old Testament. No. He's all about grace. He's the God of the living. And he's going to correct all of the wrongs that have been done on this world. How he's going to do it, we can only surmise. We can only guess. (sighs) Ah. But it's going to be great. And with that, beloved, I will bring this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer to a much-deserved close. Thank you for hanging with me. I went well over the hour that I had originally allotted, but I got into the uh, calendar issues at the beginning, which took up about 15 minutes of that, which if I had stuck with just not talking about it, we would have been at the hour. But... um, I hope that you did get something out of our discussion of tour reading 127 and Abba willing we'll be back next week with tour reading 128 again Abba willing unless Yah has other plans and until then and as always may you be most blessed fellow saints in training Shavua Tov Shabbat Shalom until next time Take care.